This is going to be Matthew chapter 6. And it's going to be about how what you do today can fix tomorrow. I mean, you don't need to worry about tomorrow. If you take care of today, then things tomorrow will fall into place. But what are some things to focus on today? The first thing is the motive. What's your motive that you have today, starting out today? It says in Matthew 6, 1, Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. So alms is what you give to relieve the poor. Things like that. But what is your motive behind doing this? The Lord says, take heed. In other words, use caution and great care to see that you're not giving alms just to be seen of men. Is that your motive while you're doing it? Are you doing the things you do today to be seen of men or because it actually pleases the Lord? You see, a Pharisee won't do anything unless he thinks he's going to get recognized for it. In Matthew 23, 5 it says, But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad, broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. You see, if you're doing good works and no one sees it, that's good because remember that the Lord sees it. In Proverbs 15, 3, it says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. If he sees it, it doesn't matter if anyone else does. In Matthew 6, 2, it says, Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do, in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Notice the humor from the Lord. He says, Don't sound a trumpet before thee. You know, some people make a big announcement and a big deal about what they gave and what they're giving. I remember one time I seen Tyler Perry showed up at T.D. Jake's church. And said the Lord put it on his heart to give a million dollars. I mean, he sounded a trumpet in front of thousands of people. Well, there was his reward. You see, are we doing these things for the glory of God? Or that so we can have glory of men? That sounds like something that would give him glory of men more than anything. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 5, Paul says, For neither at any time use we... Flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory. So, what's your motive for today? Is all the good things that you're going to do today so that you can get glory from men? Or are you doing it for God? In Matthew 6, 2, it says, Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Their parading of the flesh it, that's done by the Pharisees is completely for their own glory. You see, Jesus never ceases to point out the hypocrisy of people. They pretend to be something outwardly when they are wicked inwardly. In Matthew 23, 25, it says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. So what's your motive? Are you doing all these things every day to be seen of men because you're wanting glory for yourself and really on the inside, you're not where you need to be with God at all? In Matthew 6, 3, it says, But when thou doest thine alms, but when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. You see, do it so quietly that your left hand doesn't even know how much is in your right hand. Keep it on the DL. Keep it on the down low. Don't go and put it on everyone's news feed. You don't need to announce it to church or something like that. But notice the left hand and the right hand. It's the right hand that was doing the giving. And the right hand is usually the positive hand in the Bible, while the left hand is painted in more of a bad light. For example, Jesus Christ sits on the right hand of power in Matthew 26, 24. And it is those on the left hand who are cast into the lake of fire in Matthew 25, 41. Notice that pattern when you look at the left hand and the right hand in the Bible. 
In Matthew 6, 4, it says that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. You see, the less people know about what you're giving, the better. If you're doing things for God, then God's going to see it. It doesn't matter if anybody else sees it. Because you're doing it for God and not for them. Even if nobody knows about it now, even the good secrets are going to come out in the open. It says in Luke 8, 17, For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything here that shall not be known and come abroad. You see, we use that for secret sins most of the time, but that would also be the things that you've done in secret. It's going to come out. Because in Daniel 2.22 it says, He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. Do you know how many secrets the Lord is keeping right now? One day he's going to reveal them all. So what's the motive behind the things that you do? What's the motive when you're praying in front of other people? In Matthew 6.5 it says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen as men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. There are some men who love to be called on to pray, and they put on a big show. How do you know if you're putting on a big show? Well, does your prayer in a crowd sound 1,000 times more spiritual than it does when you're alone? I mean, naturally, you might talk more proper in public, but you know you're praying to be seen of men when you start saying words and phrases that you don't say in private. In the Pharisees' mind, they think that the prayer does not even count if other men don't see it. They think, what's the point of this good deed, you know, if nobody on earth sees it? That is an example of someone who is doing good works, but they're still earthly minded. Everything they're doing is to be seen of men. And some of the greatest looking people you know only look good outwardly. Inside, their motive is completely for self, and they're just as word worldly as any drunk or something like that. In Matthew 6, 6, it says, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Now, does this mean we can only pray in private? Well, no, because in 1 Timothy 2, 8, it says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. 1 Thessalonians five seventeen, pray without ceasing. We can't do these two verses if we can only pray in the closet. But at the same time, it's good to get alone with God and pray. And time spent in prayer is setting up treasures in heaven. The more you pray with the right motive, the more openly you'll be rewarded. Now, under the time period when Jesus said, reward thee openly, may have been in their present life. Applying it to a Christian, I would say they are rewarded openly for prayer at the judgment seat of Christ in front of all the saints. In Matthew 6, 7, it says, But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. You see, vain repetition doesn't mean you can't pray the same prayer over and over. You know, an example of vain repetition would be to take like a rehearsed prayer that maybe you didn't even write and then read it as a tradition without it being from the heart. You saying it out of tradition or habit and not from the heart, that is vain repetition. However, any prayer that is prayed from the heart with the right motive is a good prayer, no matter how many times that you've said it. And people say the same rehearsed prayers because they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. Some people have prayed the same prayer a thousand times in front of people, so they just sound like a huge professional in prayer. But once it goes, it goes back to having the wrong motive when you do things. Are you doing it from the heart or is it to be seen of men? Really, only the Lord knows if you're doing it from the heart. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. So the Lord tells the people you aren't supposed to be like. Who's that? The fake people, hypocritical, religious crowd. God knows what you need before you even pray for it. He knows what you need better than you do. Now, what about the, the disciples' prayer? People usually refer to it as the Lord's prayer, but it's actually the disciples' prayer. That's who's being told to pray this prayer in these verses. In Matthew 6, 9, it says, After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So after this manner, there wouldn't be anything wrong 
with constructing your prayer like this prayer. But if you're just copying the prayer word for word without it coming from the heart, you got the wrong motive and that's going to fall in the category of vain repetition. But he says, Our Father which art in heaven. Me and you have direct access to the Father in heaven through prayer. It says in Hebrews 4.16, Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He says, Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed means you've got to treat it with reverence. It's sacred. You see, many times someone amps up their prayer by saying something like, Almighty oh, God, O oh, Lord, Heavenly Father, God, the omnipotent, Heavenly God of creation, these things like that. If someone means that from the heart, then that, that's okay. But many times they add that extra oomph in there to look good. If they're saying that to make themselves look good, then really they aren't respecting his name. It's like they're taking it in vain. Uh, Matthew 6, 10, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. This shows we're dealing with the millennial kingdom because it won't be until then that things are done in earth as it is in heaven. You see what I mean? Jesus Christ has to come back and set up his kingdom on earth himself before that his will will be done in earth as it is in heaven. This, You see, this is the constitution for the kingdom we're reading here. This is about something that hasn't even taken place yet. He says in Matthew 6, 11, Give us this day our daily bread. The Lord has given you your daily bread. You have 24-7 access to the word of God, and you need to read it daily. It says in Deuteronomy 17, 18 through 19, And it shall be, when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book, out of that which is before the priest, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life. Read therein all the days of his life. There's your good verse for daily Bible reading. That he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law, these statutes, to do them. There is your daily bread. These people in uh, Acts 17, 11, searched the scriptures daily to see whether those things were so. And now, you need to search the scriptures daily. Matthew 6, 12, and forget us, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. This verse easily proves that this is doctrinally for a different time period altogether. Because we don't get our debts forgiven by forgiving others. We got forgiven by, because we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in Acts 13, 38, it says, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. When it comes to salvation, all our sins are forgiven in the past and the present and the future. Even any unforgiveness that may happen in my life, if I just choose not to forgive somebody, even that unforgiveness that I got is is covered under the blood on a now on a practical day-to-day -day basis in regards to fellowship with god our sins are forgiven when we confess them it says in first john 1 9 if we confess our sins he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness but when it comes to our salvation our eternity every sin that i've ever committed am committing or will commit is covered under the blood no matter what even if i didn't confess them even the, the, the sin of me not forgiving somebody else. My salvation and my forgiveness for salvation is not determined on me forgiving others. In Matthew 6.13, it says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So it says in the millennium, the people will be delivered from evil. It doesn't say in the millennium, but we know it is because this is the constitution for the kingdom. It says, lead us not tempt into temptation, but deliver us from evil. They will be delivered from evil in the millennium. Satan will be chained in the pit. The unclean spirit will be made to pass out of the land. And men in their fleshy bodies will still have temptations from the flesh that they will need to be let out of. So he says, lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. In Matthew 6, 14, it says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. You see, in the kingdom, if the people don't forgive others, they're not going to get forgiveness. 
Once again, this can't be, be referring to me and you. In the kingdom, you're going to be walking around in a glorified body that's incapable of sinning. And when you got saved, it wasn't based on your forgiving of others. It was based on believing on Jesus Christ. It says in Matthew 6, 15, But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now he is he's going to talk about fasting. What's your motive for fasting? In Matthew 6, 16, Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. The hypocrites fasted. Once again, what was the motive? To be seen of men. If your motive, if everything you do in this life, if the motive is to be seen of men, uh, you're not helping yourself in the future. You're not helping tomorrow. Everything you need to do that you do today the motive needs to be on serving God. If you do, if every day you wake up and you're doing everything for yourself, one of these days you're going to wake up at the judgment seat of Christ and get nothing because it was all done for yourself. But these guys, they let the fast show all over their face so that the people would say, wow, what a man of God this is. You see, you have your reward down here when you publicize your fasting for the world to see. It says in Matthew six seventeen, But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head, and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. You don't have to let every, anyone know you're fasting. Wash your face, wash your hair, smile, keep your eyes wide. The more you do in secret, the better off you're going to be at the judgment seat of Christ. So far, it's been about the motive. Now it's going to be about the master. Who is your master? Who's the master for you? Do you serve God or do you serve mammon? That is your riches and your wealth, your mammon. If you serve mammon, then you can guarantee it will mess up your motive. In Matthew 6, 19, it says, Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. You can lay up all kinds of treasures on this earth, but moth, rust, and thieves are going to get a hold of it. These things down here are temporal. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.18, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. If your main focus is on the temporal, then you got the wrong master, and you're going to end up having the wrong motive. In Matthew 6.20, But lay, not, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. You see? Look at this. Your motive, your master is going to affect your motive. Instead of laying up treasures in heaven, you're laying up treasures down here. So therefore, when you woke up, you were doing everything that you were doing to set you up in this life. And that may do good, do you some good today, but it's not going to fix tomorrow. The Bible says in Colossians 3, 2, Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For where your treasure, in Matthew 6, 21, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If your treasure is in the world, then your heart will be in the world. You need to have your treasure in heaven. Then your heart will be in heaven. Your motive will be for things up there. In 1 John 2, 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 2 Timothy 4.10, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. It changed Demas. When he got worldly, it changed him. It made him, instead of following Paul, he forsook Paul. In Matthew 6.22, it says, The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, the whole body shall be full of light. If your eye is single, then you have one purpose. You aren't being pulled back and forth between God and the world. And Colossians 3.22 says, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. One purpose. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. There's the motive. You're doing it to the Lord in singleness of heart. The light of the body is the eye. The eye is like the lamp for your body. It, it's what allows you to see everything. If you keep your eye on the prize, 
the eternal prize, pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, then your body will be full of light. This is what happens when you walk in the light as he's in the light. And if you put your eye on the temporal things constantly, then your whole body gets full of the wrong things. It gets full of darkness. It says in Matthew 6, 23, But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? If you live to serve the money master, then you're full of darkness. And Matthew 6, 24, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. For example, a preacher who loves money will throw most of the Bible on the shelf and despise it because preaching it would hurt his money income. He can't serve both. He must give the Bible even if it makes everyone hate him and the money stop coming in. If you have the wrong master, then you're going to have the wrong motive. And if you have the right motive and the right master, then also realize there is no need to take thought for the morrow. If you have the right motive and the right master, then tomorrow will fix itself. It says in Matthew 6.25, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? If you're setting affection on things above, your master is in heaven. And your motive has to do with making a positive effect on heaven in eternity. You're, and not worrying about things right here, then you ain't got nothing to worry about tomorrow. You see, life is more than meat. It says in Colossians 3, 4, when Christ who is our life, Jesus Christ is your life. Life is more than meat. He says in Matthew 6, 25, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for the body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Life is more than raiment. That's your clothes, your raiment. And, but it says in 1 Timothy 6, 8, having food and raiment, let us be there with content. That's all you need in life that you, to be content, food and raiment. But even life is more than that. Anyone listening to this right now has never went too long without food. If you did, you wouldn't be here. Uh, you all have raiment or you would go to jail for indecent exposure. God has took care of everyone reading this or listening to this. And it says in Matthew 6, 26, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? If the Lord takes care of the birds, will they not take care of you? It says, Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And that's rough preaching for a little guy. But why are you worried about your height? You can't think inches onto your body. You're basically taking thought for nothing. Quit letting pointless thoughts stay in your brain rent-free up there. These kind of thoughts aren't beneficial. You know, get some thoughts in your mind that will make you heavenly-minded. It says in Matthew 6, 28, And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Spin, as in like spinning wool. You see, the lilies of the field don't do any work to buy clothes or to make their own clothes. But in, it says, And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. With all the money Solomon had, he didn't have as good of raiment as God put on the lilies of the field. He took care of them. Why couldn't he take care of you? It says, Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? If God is going to clothe the grass that's just going to get mowed down, will he not clothe you? Why worry about the morrow? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? You spend so much time worrying about things that aren't even going to happen. It says, For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. After all these things do the Gentiles seek, it says. You're spending your time focusing on the things that the lost man focuses on, when all you focus on is what's down here. It says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Concentrate on getting up every day, heavenly minded, with the right motive, making sure that you got the right master, and then tomorrow is going to take care of itself. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. If you do what you need to do today, then you will you will be prepared for the future. If you wake up and work today, 
then you'll have food for tomorrow. If you raise your kids right today, then they're going to treat you good in the future. If you love your wife today, then that lowers the risk of divorce. Do what you need to do today. In Proverbs 27, 1, it says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. James 4, 15, For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Do what you need to do today. Serve God today. Tomorrow will take care of itself.